Hi, today we're going to focus on how to get the most out of your off-season workouts. As hockey players, we need to be really good at a wide range of athletic disciplines, which is why planning and periodizing your training is so important. Today, I'm going to show you how. I'm Adam from Vital Hockey, the first live online hockey training program in the sport. When we talk about field hockey fitness, what are we talking about? First up, we're talking about cardio endurance, speed and agility. All so that we can get around the field. We have to be able to run for a long time, run fast, and run fast often. Then we get onto the ball. We need core strength and muscle endurance so that we can hold that proper squatted body position, be mobile while down in it, all for around 60 minutes. It's a lot, too much to focus on all at once. Fear not, it's a very achievable solution and it's called periodization. What is periodization? Simply splitting up your year into separate chunks where each chunk focuses on a different athletic discipline. We need to be organized, use our calendars, and then plan different types of training throughout the year, all relative to our three or four month hockey season. So today, I'm gonna to show you how to plan your training periods throughout the year. Firstly, I'm gonna take you through the different types of training. What should, we, what should we be doing, and show you how they will improve you as a hockey player. Then at the end, we're gonna bring it all together and create your ideal training calendar for the entire year. We're going to start with cardio endurance. Being able to have energy for the entire game is so important. The more energy we have, the more ground we can cover, the more sprints we can handle, the better our decisions we're going to make. All of this is tied to our cardio endurance. Now, I don't want to get too bogged down with science, but there's two major energy systems that power our athletic performance. We have our aerobic and our anaerobic systems. These are two entirely different systems that use different, different biological processes to create energy in our bodies. When we talk about cardio endurance, we are talking specifically about our aerobic system. This is longer lasting, slower burning energy that some, somebody like a triathlete or a marathon runner, they have that in space. As hockey players, we don't need to be on their level, but we still need a lot of it. And it's often neglected in our training. Coaches will often say, oh, you never run five miles in a straight line during a game, so we're not gonna do that as part of our training. Well, guess what? Boxers don't run five miles in a straight line in the ring either. But you see world champion after world champion going on grueling three, five, ten mile runs up hills as part of their training. Why do they do that? They want to improve their aerobic base, which means they can do more and more activity while their heart rate remains low. As hockey players, we need to be doing the same thing. So how do you do it? You need to run slower and train at a low heart rate. As soon as we start sprinting, our heart rate rises fast. This is when our body switches system from aerobic to anaerobic. So guess what? When we switch away from aerobic, we stop training and improving our aerobic capabilities, which is another reason why hockey players often neglect us. We love to sprint. So in short, cardio endurance training is keeping our heart rate low, usually below 140 beats per minute, although this can sometimes vary from person to person. A good rule of thumb is to be able to have a conversation with a friend while on a run. If you can do this while engaged in the activity, you are probably still in the aerobic zone. Once you are out of breath and you can't talk, your heart rate is going to be too high and you'll have moved to an anaerobic system. Alright, now we're looking at speed. A popular myth used to be that speed can't be trained, we're just born with it. Now obviously some of us are born with a lot more natural speed than others, and this is to do with the density and the strength of the fast twitch fibers in our muscles. However, it is 100% possible to become faster with the right training. As Pavel Satsulin, the legendary Russian strength coach, always says, to get faster, you either have to lift fast or lift heavy. Lifting weights in the gym has long been the most popular method of getting faster because we can target these fast twitch muscles. We can do this in two ways. We either lift heavy uh, for a small number of reps um, so we're talking about sets of four to six reps with as much weight as you can handle. Um, and movements such as the deadlifts, especially with the hex bar, squats and lunges, these are going to be uh, types of movements in the gym that are going to build those fast twitch muscles in your hamstrings and your glutes that are going to keep you speed. The other way to get faster is through fast movement. Uh, and that is generally trained with jumping and plyometrics, as well as things like a kettlebell swing. 
You should be working on these for uh, longer amounts of reps, so 12 to 15 reps in each set. Um, and you alternate this between lifting heavy and plyometrics, and that's going to be a great speed workout. Training this way can really improve your top line speed, even if you're already an elite athlete. In 2003, Alison Phoenix was a 17 year old high school student, and in the space of 12 months, she broke all of Marion Jones' high school records in the two went on to run the fastest 200 meters in the world and then became the first high school athlete to go directly into professional track. Her coach was a guy called Barry Ross, who developed a unique training program of lifting as heavy as possible in sets of just two to three reps and in between using plyometrics. He focused much of his training on the deadlift. I think you know what happened from here. Allison went on have maybe the greatest career of any female sprinter in history. Now, don't just dive in on speed training in the gym. You need proper technique and coaching to get the most out of all these kinds of exercises, and importantly, that you don't get injured. So make sure you get a trainer to work with you if you're new to any of this kind of stuff. Okay, agility. How does speed differ from agility? Well, agility is about how fast we can change direction and how fast we can react. These are not the same thing. A lot of agility training is solely changing direction training. For example, short shuttle runs, ladder drills, and cone drills. These are all important. They make you change direction quickly, and they train those muscles in small spaces, which is exactly what we want to be doing. However, they're predictable. Our brain knows ahead of time when we need and where we need to turn. And this is not reflective of how agility works in real life. True agility is being able to react fast to avoid an unexpected obstacle, like a defender coming out of nowhere and trying to tackle you, or a goalkeeper suddenly charging you inside the circle. A hockey game is not predictable. We need to be able to train our brain and muscles to react to all of these unforeseen obstacles. In fact, the International Journal of Sports Science and Coaching tested athletes on both change in direction versus agility. Most of us would expect that the results would be the same, right? One athlete who was good at change of direction would also be good at agility. But in fact, the results showed that there was zero correlation. That just showed the importance of training the reactive decision making in order to gain true agility. You're not just going to be agile because you can change direction fast. For agility training, it's best to add in a partner or a coach so you can add in unpredictability to a drill. Have them shout out each movement you need to make so that you don't know what's going to come until the last second. Okay, the core. Everybody always talks about core, core, and core. Why is everyone always running around about core? It seems like the answer to all fitness questions are more core, more core strength, usual core, yada, yada, yada. It's annoying. It's annoying, but like making sure you eat a lot of greens, it's annoying and true, unfortunately. The core is just really, really important, and especially so for our team players. Really for all athletes, because it gives us stability and power transfer. We've all felt it. When we focus on crunching our abs, we feel better balanced, more stable in whatever position we're in. This balance and body control is the hallmark of all good athletes. And in hockey, it allows us to move fast with the ball, change direction quickly, get down low into tackles, it is part of all our body movements in the game. The more stable we can be at higher speeds, at the ends of our ranges of motion, the better athletes will become. Now, what did I talk about power transfer? Our core is a connector. It allows power to be generated from our muscles and our legs and flow up into our upper body and vice versa. The stronger our core, the more efficient that transfer is. So, in skills such as aerial passes or drag flips, when we're generating a huge amount of power in our legs that eventually goes through our arms and stick to the ball, our core is really, really important. Lastly, muscle endurance. Muscle endurance is essentially the number of times your body can repeat a certain movement or the amount of time you can sustain it. Examples would be a long ball sit or a plank, a high number of reps for a bench press or a large number. For hockey, this is most important in our legs, core, and lower back, so that we can hold and constantly get down to a good hockey position and squat throughout the game, all the way to the end. 
getting caught too upright at the end of the game because of muscle fatigue is a really, really common issue for many players and something that we can really remedy with the right training. So there we have it. Aerobic endurance, speed, agility, core strength, and muscle endurance. Five pillars we need to focus on throughout our year. Now, I'll be making more videos on each of these, diving deep into specific workouts you can do to improve each. So comment below and let me know which ones you want to start with, and I'm going to cover those first. Before that, let's understand how we should set up our training calendar so that we have enough time to improve across the board and not get overwhelmed. I'm going to base this first calendar on a four month hockey season, which is split into two two month periods of the mid season break. But then I'll give you some other options if you need to adjust it to a three or a two month season. In this example, your season is October, November, break in December, and then January and February. So let's tackle what to do during the season first. If you have training and matches three to four times per week, then you don't want to be doing too much more. Ideally, you have around five active days per week, two for rest and recovery. So you may have one or two days where you can add in a workout. I would split these between core and aerobic endurance and then core and muscle endurance. Your matches and hockey training will contain a lot of the other elements. Now, when I say two work days of rest and recovery, that doesn't mean do nothing for those two days. Some active recovery is always advisable, a long walk or a nice slow run, some yoga, pilates or mobility work. These are good activities to do on your rest days. And what about in your mid-season break? Your body's been working hard, so I would suggest reducing your activity, maybe to three, four days a week. Focus about 50% of those days on muscle endurance and core, and then fill in the other sessions by alternating between speed work, agility work, and aerobic. Now, month one, post season. In this example, that would be March. This is about recovery and correcting any muscle imbalances that you've built up by a long, hard season. And we're also preparing your body for the rest of the year. So it's gonna look quite similar to your mid-season break. I would think about roughly three workouts a week, two focused on muscle endurance, and one focusing on aerobic endurance. Adding core to each, and then also plenty of recovery work in those other days. Now, April through June, or post-season months, two to four. This is where we build our energy. Huge focus on aerobic endurance. Four runs a week in this lower heart rate zone, and then maybe one session of core, of core muscle endurance, just to keep our athletic moment, movements ticking over. After this training block, we can reduce aerobic training a little bit and start to add in some more speed work. So for July month five, I'd go down to maybe two aerobic runs and two speed work sessions per week. Speed sessions being the heavy lifting and plyometrics that I talked about earlier. Now we're into August and pre-season. This is two months out from the start of your next season. Your training focus now should really shift to speed and agility. These workouts will be intense, so I would plan on maybe four per week with plenty of time for rest. Focus one of your speed sessions on power and heavy lifts and jumping, and then the other two speed sessions per week should be focused on sprints. These can be high speed intervals or hill sessions, but lots and lots of sprints to try and get you prepared for how a game is going to feel. Lastly, I'd add in one agility session per week. This should all get you to week one of your matches in great shape, ready to go and achieve all your hockey goals for the season. So there you have it, how to plan all your training over a year. This method will maximize your gains, keep you injury free and improve all aspects of your conditioning as it relates to football. You can download this training calendar plus definitions and workout suggestions for each training discipline in a free PDF. You just need to go to vitalhockey.live slash training calendar. I hope you enjoyed this video. Click subscribe to get notified when all Vital Hockey's new workouts and tools get released. Until next time, keep getting better.